to some unforeseen reasons dr gopinath sir won't be uh, coming today he would be joining us tomorrow but for now we have dr krishna kishore sir dr krishna kishore sir would be conducting the third session on the topic wire arc additive manufacturing of metal alloys dr krishna kishore is sir is an assistant professor at the national institute of technology surat with expertise in advanced fabrication technology Jis including why why art am friction stir welding so you may start now thank you sir thank you thank you sir let me share the screen Uh, i hope my voice is audible yeah it is good now we can see your screen yes thank you so good evening uh, all of you uh, myself krishna kishore i am working as an assistant professor in snit surat my primary research area is in welding so we work in solid state welding like friction state welding friction welding and also we are working on fusion based welding processes like mig welding tig welding and plasma arc welding so when we are thinking two three years before uh, what what we can uh, how we can extend our research towards additive manufacturing then we uh, we, we came uh, across this last scale additive manufacturing technique that is wire arc additive manufacturing technique where we will be using heat source as an arc so we started working with different alloys like uh, initially we begin with aluminum alloys and stainless steel inconels and some of my students are working on stainless steel inconel and aluminum alloys they are uh, um, doing good and i will be sharing some of their research work insights uh, which is yet to be published uh, but i will be sharing with you uh, in this uh, talk so basically i will be covering stainless steels of 316l grade and uh, one or two aluminum alloys and i will be discussing more about the challenges of how uh, like what are the challenges we are facing why we are manufacturing of uh, these alloys with this uh, uh, i would like to acknowledge professor s arvind nath professor ravi kumar professor ravi kumar sir professor yan professor uh, dr chipu dr kuhin and my phd students who contributed a uh, lot of work to these slides so as madhukar and uh, professor atre has discussed additive manufacturing is not at all a new concept so it is well existing in the nature so the basic steps if we see uh, like uh, initially we begin with a design cad design and we will be doing some kind of pre processing like generation of stl file tool cost strategies process parameter optimization and then then we can have some kind of simulations where material process and structure interaction will be there and then we will be linking with the printer and the printing deposition of the material will be taking place then depending on the process some kind of post treatment or surface finish treatments will be taking place and then it will be having the final component which can be ready for the use so these are the conventional steps and if i am uh, talking about the process development which i will be mainly focusing on the deposition process which is directly linked with the uh, vam vam is a um, derived product of direct energy deposition process and the first patent is in 1980 uh, uh, related to the rapid prototyping technology and uh, the development of dd process has been taken place in 1995 so as for the uh, standards uh, basically the classification if you see uh dr madhukar has already covered it like the powder bed fusion direct energy deposition binder jetting and sheet lamination basically we if we see in this uh, little bit uh, uh, compact categories and uh, we will be focusing on direct energy deposition where the feed stock either it can be the pop it can be of the powder or it can be of wire so our uh, research is based on the wire and we will be using mostly the arc based heat source to melt this wire and to deposit it so we are having the conventional uh, arc sources like gas metal arc welding gas tension arc welding plasma arc welding 
and also the advanced gas metal oxidizing process that is the CMT. So we will be discussing about these processes and then how this uh, some parameters affect the deposition uh, uh, for the microstructure development in the as deposited samples. So if you see the direct energy deposition process, please. So if you see the direct energy deposition process, this is a layer by layer uh, uh, deposition where the coax, the powder is coaxially fed and it is being melted with a laser source. Okay. So <clears throat> the if instead of the uh, uh, powder, if we are using wire as a feedstock and instead of the laser source, if we are using the arc as a heat source, then the process is termed as the wire arc additive manufacturing where we are melting the wire with the conventional heat source of uh, conventional welding heat source. Whatever the welding heat source are the conventional, we can directly use it in order to have a layer by layer deposition at the same time to achieve a desired three dimensional functionality. So we are having this basically uh, three uh, uh, conventional heat source that is based on the gas metal arc welding. So if you are using a GMAW, then a GMAW based DED process we will be calling, or we will also call conventional uh, uh, wire arc additive manufacturing. It's a general term. Or gas tension arc welding, uh, GTA based DED process, or plasma arc welding, uh, PA based DED process. The process is quite simple. We will be using these uh, uh, heat sources to melt the wire, just like in the conventional arc welding. And we will be depositing and we will be having some kind of XYZ specially designed XYZ table in order to have our uh, uh, toolpath strategies in order to get the desired component. The one advantage we can say with the conventional, uh, with the uh, wire arc additive manufacturing is we can deposit, we can have a higher deposition rate. Like let's say uh, if, we, if, if we talk about the DED process or uh, conventional power to bed fusion, the deposition rates are very slow. If we want to build a component, uh, it will, it, the lead times will be a little bit higher compared to the VAM process. Here, the deposition rate can go up to 10 kg per hour, depending on the type of the material we are using. And the thickness is also, uh, approximately the minimum thickness we will be having is 1 mm. Right? So although uh, it is having uh, quite good advantages, uh, like uh, it is also having some, it is also suffering with some uh, drawbacks that we will discuss in a little later stage. What are the drawbacks we are having in this process? The other C, uh, the other uh, arc source which we will be using, the advanced GMA based process, is the cold metal transfer. It is having the uh, we will be droplet here actually how the droplet is detached and how the droplet is being transferred to the substrate. It will play a key role in the microstructural formation. At the same time, uh, it is also controlling the surface finish. So we can alter the voltage and current waveforms in order to adjust these detachments and also adjust the surface finish of the final component. So one such uh, 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 advanced GMA-based process is cold metal transfer. We can control the uh, voltage waveforms like current and uh, voltage. Uh, we can also create some kind of short circuiting, uh, different uh, metal mode transfers we can create. And at very low current, we are doing Pearl CMT advanced. We are having. We are Uh, I'm sorry for the disturbance. Um, I hope now it is audible again. Yes, yes, sir. 
Yeah, sorry. Uh, yes, yes, thank you. So the process parameters that uh, affect the warm VAM process, uh, like uh, we can uh, mainly talk about what kind of feedstock we are using and what is the diameter of this, uh, this wire. So generally the suggestible diameters as per the nozzles available in the conventional uh, building market is like 1.2. We will also be going with 1.4, 1.6, depending on the requirement. And uh, in uh, the university, there, I, uh, I, I, I did my postdoc, they are using some kind of wire of uh, square shape. So they have a special process uh, uh, where they manufacture their own wires and uh, they will use this kind of conventional square shape types of wire. So this also play a key role in um, the deposited micro as deposited, uh, the microstructure of as deposited sample. The other one is the depending on the geometry, what kind of tool path we are using and how many layers we are going to deposit in order to achieve my final component. And what, what is the distance between the two beads? If I'm going some parallel bead, what is the distance between the two beads? We will be seeing this thing in a case study, which uh, I will be discussing. Uh, which we are doing in SVNIT and uh, the heat source obviously what kind of heat source we are selecting how what kind of parameters we can vary in the heat source like voltage current and the travel speeds which we will be designing and the equipment the equipment and heat source is the uh, relevant thing and <clears throat> the geometry of the uh, structure geometry based on the geometry we will be designing the tool path strategies and also the gas flow rate. So the shielding is whatever the shielding is we are using, uh, how the shielding is going to uh, cool or at, at what faster rate it can cool or how it can interact with the deposited uh, molten uh, droplet. And some of the present challenges, if we see, uh, it is the material diversity, uh, some, uh, uh, some materials like Whatever materials we can melt with arc welding, uh, conventional arc welding sources, that these materials can be obviously deposited, and uh, and the solidification actually uh, plays a key role. How the solidification and what is the phase diagram behind this particular material? Like what temperatures, what kind of phases are forming? These kind of material diversity restrictions are there, and uh, if you see. Uh, the microstructure from the bottom to the top, from the substrate to the top, there might be some kind of uh, anisotropic uh, form, anisotropic kind of properties we can see. We cannot say that the microstructure at the bottom and the microstructure at the middle and the microstructure at the top is uh, almost the same. Right? We will see a case study which requires a post processing and we, which requires each and uh, after each and every deposition, it requires a lot of uh, post processing. Um, activities we will be taking in order to achieve a uniform uh, grain growth, which is which is quite challenging to get in the uh, VAM process. Also, the surface finish, we cannot achieve uh, the component which we deposit, uh, obviously requires some kind of uh, machining operation at the end in order to have our component ready for application. Also, there are simulation challenges. There is no uh, particular uh, dedicated software for it. People are working in Simufact, people are working in Abacus, People are working in console in order to integrate uh, this deflex. And they're, they're, managed, they're uh, entering their own codes, reflex with the abacus and trying to simulate the VAM process. And uh, still, uh, uh, there is a scope in, in uh, doing research in this area. And also, so many online detecting uh, where we can see by variation of little bit current and voltage, how the droplet size or droplet uh, while detaching what is the temperature of this droplet and during the droplet transfer, what is happening, how the droplet is interacting with the uh, atmosphere because the arc length will be there and with, uh, in this arc length during the transfer of the droplet, there might be some lot of interactions that will be happening with the atmosphere or in the shielding gas, how these interactions are going to affect my microstructure. So these are the things, uh, these are different challenges and also the residual stresses. Obviously, if you are going with large scale additive manufacturing with, uh, uh, let's say, more than 200 mm we have seen in the lab, there is a lot of distortion in the steel sheets, also in the case of aluminum sheets. So uh, some of the literature uh, uh, we have collected for uh, the stainless steel sheet. I will be discussing the observations in the sheet. like. 
Voltage and travel speed, um, as I said, are the major parameters in order to affect the bead width. So it will actually, uh, these are the two important parameters that will actually uh, create the heat and make uh, the uh, detachment of the droplet will be taking place. And once it is deposited, what kind of bead width is there? We will see in a, a little bit later uh, diagram, what is the bead width and bead height. And the welding current and travel speed also has a significant effect on the bead height. So the bead geometry, the width or height is being affected by this voltage and current parameters. Also, there is a uh, quite uh, different variation from the bottom to the top layer. If you see the microstructural variation or, or there is a microstructural variation at the same time, there is a micro hardness variation from the bottom to the top. It requires some kind of cooling. It requires some kind of post treatments. It, it requires some kind of rolling action in order to control these parameters. So that is what people are uh, working rigorously to increase the scan speed or to increase the, to reduce the formation of different phases at different temperatures to in order to uh, have the uh, less flag if we are using some kind of thick based DED process. So these are some of the observations from the literature. But what we will be discussing is the manufacturing of stainless steel wheels uh, with different process parameters and also uh, some metallurgical analysis and mechanical analysis we have done. We will be discussing about the tensile uh, properties, hardness, microstructure, how these uh, properties has been there and uh, defects, what kind of defects we have observed in during the process. So uh, ours is like a GMA based uh, uh, VAM setup, which includes some kind of uh, controls, which have the CMT uh, module also. And the selection of the wire is of 1.2 mm and the substrate plate dimension is shown here. And during after each layer of deposition, we have been allowing it to cool for 30 seconds uh, with the uh, gas flow rate of 15 liters per minute. And uh, in order to avoid this residual stress formation uh, and the targeted height is approximately 60 mm and this will be accomplished by 40 liters. And we have some important parameters like current, travel speed, and gas flow rate. So it is uh, it is very good in uh, in the very beginning stage to start with an uh, design of experiment or the uh, in order to optimize the parameters. And uh, the parameters are varied as per the machine limit and also as per the literature for this particular LO. Like the uh, current is varied from 100 to 140 and travel speed is varied from 200 to 280 and the gas flow rate is varied from 10 to 20. Although the variations are small, we can see a significant changes in um, the microstructure when we are uh, uh, discussing the results. And some of the parameters like uh, the wire feed rate is constant, 3.2 meters per minute, arc length is maintained at 20 mm. And the number of layers we decided to uh, deposit is 40 as per the requirement of the size uh, based on the samples we want to extract for the testing and other things we have calculated. And it is approximately like 40 layers. So we can deposit few layers and see what kind of thickness and uh, height it is coming. And based on that, we can uh, estimate for this, uh, this much of height, how many layers we have to deposit. So in the initial trials, we can see the visual inspection of all these nine samples which have been deposited uh, for the sing, uh, for the uh, single layer and uh, some of the specimens we have observed defective because uh, in the surface itself we can see a lot of porosity that is being formed and some uh, conditions at some condition we can see the, the formation of the bead is very perfect the formation of the bead is uniform and perfect and these kind of conditions we have considered in the later stage in order to have a uniform thickness sample of uniform thickness wall. Right? And because of some high uh, voltage conditions or some kind of low travel speed conditions, these kind of defects are there and insufficient gas flow rate are also resulting in these kind of defective resonance. Now, after uh, a few trails, uh, uh, we have succeeded to deposit uh, 40 layers in different conditions. You can see uh, the deposition has started from the right hand side and it has went to the left hand side. You can see there is a, uh, a non-uniform height. You can see there is an uh, inclination uh, 
uh, this we will discuss why this kind of inclination and why overheating because of this overheating of layers how this kind of curvature has been formed for different layers and we have also tried a um, deposition strategy of bi-directional and in the bi-directional you can see the balance of the heat uh, on the both sides and uh, we, we will have a perfect uh, wall that uh, we will be discussing in the later stage and the samples which we have extracted uh, like uh, after the deposition inside we have extracted microstructure and uh, for the microstructure and micro hardness in specimen so for the bead width and bead height although the specimen is little bit higher uh, it is it is uh, a little bit uh, 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 having uh, 60 to 70 mm height it is always good to study at the interface what is the microstructural formation at the bottom region some layers we will be considering and we will be seeing what kind of microstructural changes are there in this bottom region and middle region and also top region the specimens are extracted at different regions at the, uh, starting from the interface to the bottom middle and top layers now in order to understand the, the microstructural part of the stainless steel or uh, particular uh, metallic alloys, it is always important to understand two such uh, important parameters. One is the temperature gradient and the solidification rate. So, but what temperature gradient and the what solidification rate this uh, particular droplet is being subjected to? Based on that, we will be we might be having uh, at the low G by R ratio. We will be calculating two ratios. One is G by R ratio and one is G into R. So, based on this. We may be having at low G, G by R ratios if we add dendritic structures, and also at high G by R ratio, we may be having some kind of planar structures. And if G GR ratio is a uh, little bit higher, then lower cooling rates, or if it is a little bit uh, uh, high, uh, sorry, uh, lower cooling rates and at higher cooling rates, we may be having some kind of fine structure. And if it is lower, we may be having some kind of coarser grain structure. So, this is what. Uh, uh, in general, uh, if we see the morphology that can be happening up in the microstructure development. Also, heat dissipation. Heat dissipation is another important parameter. Like uh, we are continuously depositing, and uh, if we deposit one layer on the, uh, it will be conducting the heat to the substrate, and also the uh, the heat is conducted to the surroundings. Uh, if we are depositing the another layer, the subsequent uh, layer which has deposited will conduct the layer to the first one and also it will be conducting the heat to the substrate and also to the surrounding layers. So based on these uh, heat input parameters and how much heat we are inputting, what is the deposition pattern and what is the, the environmental temperature that is maintained either with the gas flow rate or um, by maintaining certain uh, inter intercooling time or interpassing time the microstructure varies so these parameters are also important and also the solidification mode the phase diagram and other things we will be considering based on the percentage of uh, chromium or carbon that we are having just as <clears throat> so in particular to the stainless steel cpc uh, we can see uh, primarily Four modes, mode A, uh, where primary austenite with no ferrite solidified from the mill. We can see this kind of uh, uh, primary uh, modes of prime, uh, mode A, mode AF, where the primary austenite, uh, austenite with uh, ferrite solidified secondary uh, secondary layers from the mill will be taking place, and mode FA, uh, mode F. So these are some uh, different modes where different phases will be formed. Uh, based on the cooling rates and during the solidification. Now, if we go back, if we go to our microstructures, how the microstructures in, uh, are being developed, and in the uh, literature also, if we see a uh, few uh, people have reported uh, the formation of lathe faces and the formation of uh, skeletal ferrites uh, in the top zones of uh, the microstructures, uh, top zones of the thin walled uh, deposited samples. These are our uh, results uh, for the uh, as deposited samples uh, without any heat treatment. And if we see the interface, uh, top, bottom, and middle layers. So the first one is of the top. Uh, the second one is the middle, bottom, and at this interface. So at this interface, we can see some kind of uh, uh, diffuse zone uh, 
in the first layer and also some kind of very fine uh, and dendrites with the very fine uh, grains can be seen. And in the top layers, as uh, the uh, G by R ratio is very uh, a little bit higher, the columnar grains are there. And also at uh, different conditions, we can see delta ferrite and lathic bases also. And in the middle layers, we can see the skeletal kind of ferrites uh, with some kind of elongated uh, skeletal ferrites we can see. And also at diffuse zone, there might be some kind of elongated grains. So these we can see from uh, one uh, one particular case that the microstructural variation from the bottom to the top. So this is the interface and this is the bottom region, this is the middle region and this is the top region. At, uh, the one single specimen is having different uh, zones and different microstructures from bottom to the top. So obviously it requires some kind of uh, heat treatment, otherwise the, uh, heat, the post treatment conditions, maybe heat treatment or uh, during the uh, depositions, if we uh, have uh, the uh, either rolling or some kind of uh, uh, post deposition treatments, then we can uh, able to control some kind of microstructures development. And these are the conditions for uh, the another two specimens where the similar kind of observation is uh, noticed. Like in the top layers, we can see the lati uh, delta parites or dendrites. And in the middle layers, we are seeing the columnar kind of grains and at the interface, uh, we can see some kind of diffused, uh, diffused grains and also some kind of columnar dendrites. So these, these are the cases for different conditions in the needle structure where uh, um, at the interface, some kind of dendrites with the needle structure can also be seen. Um, uh, we, we will be calling as a skeletal and uh, Vermicular morphologies uh, as per the terminologies and uh, uh, these will actually, uh, how these will affect the properties we will be seeing in a little uh, uh, later stage when, when we are talking about the mechanical properties. So if we extract the specimen at different directions and in at different orientations like let's say 45 degrees per hour, uh, 0 degree, 45 degree and 90 degree, how the properties are getting changed and other things will be uh, uh, same. And <clears throat> the specimens that are extracted here uh, is of uh, zero degree angle. Uh, if we see the, um, the process speed uh, 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 like uh, 1.08 mm per minute uh, with uh, the capacity of the machine is uh, 100 kilo um, The specimens show a maximum ultimate tensile resistance of 600 uh, 80 or 690 megapascal for uh, approximately 690, 680 or 90 megapascal. If we talk about the ultimate tensile strength, we can say that the variation is very limited because uh, the current variation, because uh, droplet detachment uh, uh, depends majorly on the heat input that we are giving to the wire. And the wire uh, is measured because of the current conditions and the current variation we, we have taken here is very minor. And because of that, the variation we can observe in the uh, ultimate tensile strength is very limited. But if we talk about the bead geometry or if we talk about the bead properties, then the geometry is getting varied. So in the initial, in the later stages, we are uh, planning to increase the range of these current conditions. And also we will be working more rigorously on the intercooling parameters so that how the uniform uh, grain structures can be obtained. So these are some of the uh, results for the tensile uh, where we are comparing different uh, conditions in order to understand what is the diability parameter or the percentage elongation parameter that we are having for different uh, uh, cases. And we have observed at higher currents and higher current uh, deposition conditions like uh, we, which we have shown at C, uh, S7, S8 and S9 conditions, we are having the uh, more uh, ductility uh, parameters compared to the other conditions. And we have also done some kind of uh, uh, optimization uh, in order to have um, the regression analysis uh, based on this faculty analysis and NO analysis. So it is also observed that for the case of tensile strength, the major important parameter, obviously, it is the current and the uh, transfer speed for the uh, larger, the better condition and the, the optimum condition which we obtain for these kind of cases like 
100 amperes and uh, 280 meters per mm per minute for the travel speed and 15 meters uh, per minute gas flow rate. And the tensile equation, like uh, the regression equation for the tensile uh, spin case, although uh, this works only for this particular uh, uh, 316 uh, L case, where if the range is within our uh, 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 optimum range that we have selected, like 100 to 140, and then, uh, 140 amperes, then only this kind of uh, tensile equation can be applied. And uh, this shows that travel speed is having a major contribution in the uh, tensile strength, uh, 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 the tensile strength of this particular uh, uh, specimen. Although uh, we have only tested at uh, zero degrees, but uh, the literature says that if we go for 40 degrees and if we go for 90 degrees, the current and travel speed are the two important parameters that will come up for the uh, case of tensile strength. So we are in, um, uh, in the process of, uh, of uh, studying these 45 degrees and uh, 90 degrees specimens as well. And uh, hopefully in the uh, upcoming uh, days, uh, we will be presenting our new results as well. If we talk about the microstructure, microstructure actually uh, plays a key role. Uh, if we are increasing the current, the droplet detachment will be easier. And the solidification, for the solidification, it, will, it has to solidify from a high temperature to a low temperature. At the same time, if we are increasing the travel speed, so these are the two counter parameters which will uh, obviously uh, if one parameter is increasing, the other parameter is counterbalancing the uh, the amount of uh, the, uh, the the value of the hardness. So at the top regions, we can see uh, a variation of uh, uh, some um, up to uh, 190 mega, 190 HP and uh, some 180 HP in the middle zone and uh, in the bottom zone, we can say 170 or 190 um, HP. Uh, approximately, we are we are calculating at one particular stretch, and if we see the specimen at different uh, particular stretches, and then definitely uh, in different uh, different zones, uh, different sections of the wall, uh, the hardness is also uh, varying. And this for the hardness, we 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 observe that the important parameter is the current, and if we consider uh, uh, a more uh, parabolic model for this one. Uh, then uh, we can say that the, along with the current, the travel speed again plays a key role. So even if you are increasing the current or decreasing the travel speed or increasing the travel speed and decreasing the current, we will definitely alter the hardness value. Right? Again, these conditions will be working only if we are talking uh, uh, within the range of the selected parameters of our initial setup. So this equation will be valid only for 316L of within the parameters, process parameter range that we have selected. And here is the interesting thing of bead height. And we have uh, uh, used a vision measurement system where we will be um, dividing this uh, entire deposits based on different uh, layers and we will be each layer will be calculating what is the height that is having and eddy cross section what is the bead width we are having and uh, if we see uh, if i want to get a larger component so uh, here my objective will be optimizing my uh, like enhancing maximizing my bead width. if i want a wider component if i want a large uh, uh, little bit longer component then here my objective of optimization will be maximization of bead width and depending on this the parameters will be varied. so here we have studied for the two cases what uh, uh, like it, uh, uh, the optimization has to be applied for the uh, larger cases uh, like uh, building the components in this direction and for the x direction and y direction components we have seen and the equations are also representing uh, for the uh, bead height as well as bead width okay. so if I majorly see the uh, what are the conclusions that we can derive from this uh, work, uh, obviously there is a microstructural variation from the bottom to the top, and we can see mostly uh, uh, if in general if we see the two phases, we can see the ferrites and the austenitic dendrites, columnar dendrites. We are seeing 
at the top faces and also at the middle layers. If we can able to control these things, we may be getting a uniform uh, microstructure from the bottom to the top. And uh, if we are going with the higher current values, like higher current values are required for the good tensile properties, but at the same time, the coarser grains are being forming at some uh, inter, uh, like inner layers of the middle zone. So this will actually, uh, even though the properties which we observed is at the bottom of this specimen, but if we are checking the properties in the 90 degrees, then obviously the properties will be low. And also increasing uh, uh, the travel speed, also reducing some kind of uh, uh, formation of uh, the uh, dendroids at the uh, at the inter, inter, inter layers and inner layers. So uh, uh, the bead width again, the bead width and uh, uh, bead height. So if you are talking about the bead width and bead height, the current and uh, the uh, current and the travel speed are the important parameters, but Increased current will obviously increase the bead weight. That is some of our, uh, our observations from our work. And what are the challenges that we, we are facing? That is the anisotropic that, as I discussed, uh, from the bottom to the top. And also, we are working on some kind of cooling cycles and rapid heating cycles. It's like after depositing one uh, layer, uh, if we do some kind of rapid cooling, or if we do some kind of iso, uh, isostatic pressing or some kind of uh, uh, rolling or some kind of other uh, uh, metal squeezing technique, then we have to see how the microstructure will be changing. So we are working on these things. And uh, this is to uh, control the anisotropic properties that are being generated for these deposits. And uh, this is like, uh, if you see, uh, uh, for the aluminum alloys, so the one one major challenge for the aluminum alloys is the porosity formation. So uh, uh, for most of the aluminum alloys, the porosity formation is like uh, it is quickly reacting the solidification during the solidification process also, and also it is quickly reacting with the atmosphere and some hydrogen is entering into this melt pool. And we can see some kind of pores in the inner layers. If you take three layers and at the inner layer, inner layers, this kind of pores, and at this pores, some kind of cracks are getting generated. And uh, this results in the degradation of the properties. So, uh, this is one uh, simple case study which, which I uh, uh, have taken from the literature for um, a work hard in alloy of aluminum alloy uh, at a different kind like top, middle, bottom, and uh, uh, different zones. So how the microstructure is like, uh, how the uh, mechanical properties are varying, like say the micro hardness or ultimate tensile strength or percentage elongation, right? So if we compare with the conventional, if this, if this is compared with the conventional um, uh, forging, uh, forging properties or conventional um, uh, casting properties, quite, uh, we, we can say like uh, the properties are not at, up to the mark for the case of aluminum alloys because of the porosity formation. That is not the case in the case of uh, forming or uh, the case of the casting as well. So the certification range is uh, has to be uh, wide uh, and uh, because of this uniform uh, deposition is uh, a uniform microstructural formation is not happening in the case of aluminum alloys also. The increased arc length or the arc length parameters is also another parameter that we are uh, uh, taking. And the filler wires, which we are selecting uh, for the case of aluminum alloys is 1.2. And the manufacturing process by which these filler wires are manufactured and the surface contaminants of these filler wires are also having some uh, impact on this microstructural uh, formation and also the residual stress is a uh, general common uh, thing for the case of uh, aluminum alloys. Um, these are the general uh, uh, challenges that we have uh, listed out like porosity or residual stress or cracks and uh, deformation that are happening because of the porosity. Delamination of the layers is because of the improper uh, current conditions. If you select uh, less than 400 amperes and uh, other things, uh, then this delamination conditions will be occurring. And uh, 
yeah some some specific calories are there like seven series and six series if we are working some kind of uh, precipitates that can uh, form and these can be uh, 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 becoming the um, like sites for initiating the cracks or residual stresses so some of the methods uh, which we have uh, um, thoroughly seen in the literature and uh, uh, given here, like uh, post heat treatment we can do in order to control the anisotropic properties or near immersion active cooling we can do, like uh, let me show the images of this one. So uh, we can do some kind of uh, immersion technique and uh, we can cool the layers after each deposition, we can cool the, with the help of some uh, uh, liquids. We can cool it and the interpass cooling is also there where we will be using some kind of like just like a carogenic treatment or interpass rolling, cold rolling can be done. We will be using a roller and we will be squeezing this layer after deposing. Hard forging uh, can be done, forging of this uh, like just like hammering a kind of thing. We will be forging this layer after deposition with some kind of high forces where we will be using some uh, uh, additional along with this conventional uh, uh, VAM setup, we will be attaching one kind of uh, um, forging device where it will be uh, like applying some pressure on these walls. So like after each deposition, immediately uh, after the deposition, immediately uh, this will be applied. Like an, an ultra cold uh, VAM. So, this is another uh, uh, post treatment uh, or post uh, processing method. And yeah, if we talk about the benefits of this process, uh, obviously the deposition rates are quite high. Um, if we can work rigorously, uh, the material loss can be reduced by making it in ear net shape. Although at the moment we cannot say this this uh, this process is uh, completely the ear net shape. Um, when we are talking about the DED and the PBF process. And we can reduce the machining time also if we uh, work uh, on different parameters like uh, um, like surface finish and other things. If we can control this one, then uh, the machining time will also be reduced. But if we compare with the uh, DED or uh, PBF process, the lead times are red and uh, the structural integrity is good. Although it is anisotropic properties, if we take uh, conventional, uh, if we compare with the uh, as uh, received material, to the as deposited material, the properties are quite good. And uh, if we can do some kind of post treatments, then the properties will enhance a little bit more. So we can also do some uh, medium to complex components. These are some of the applications where uh, uh, this VAM 3D is the one of the um, uh, uh, like uh, Cranfield University where they are aggressively working on developing some kind of uh, um, tanks that are made of titanium and uh, they're also collaborated with some kind of uh, 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 different government uh, uh, projects and they're building some kind of uh, dams kind of thing or some kind of hook structures, crane hook structures at, um, for different applications. So the challenges I think we have discussed, uh, but these are the general challenges for most of the alloys, uh, metal alloys that we are uh, talking about, the residual stress and uh, deformation, porosity, cracks and delamination can be there, uh, surface finish and uh, uh, the staircase effect kind of thing. So we have discussed the staircase effect. We have seen in our case also, uh, this kind of staircase effect is there, uh, like uh, weaving uh, or some kind of overhang, humping kind of thing, humping effects are there, right? So this is because of the, uh, like, each layer is conducting the heat to the uh, already deposited layer and this will make this bottom layer soften and because of this, uh, the at the edge of this uh, deposition, the, uh, the we can say like uh, uh, the staircase kind of thing we can see at the end of the uh, deposition. Okay. So if we talk about different alloys, uh, what are the chances of uh, the defects that can be formed for the uh, different alloys. Like uh, we can see in the uh, porosity, if we talk about this this kind of defect, the aluminum is more subjected to the porosity. Uh, aluminum alloys, whatever are there, uh, is more severe in the case of uh, uh, aluminum alloys. And uh, uh, if we talk 
oxidation because titanium is quite good reacting with the atmosphere oxidation is more in the case of titanium and if you are talking about residual stresses bimetallic components are subjected to more residual stresses and even in aluminum also steels also we can see some kind of more uh, residual stresses severe residual stresses can be also and uh, if we are talking about delamination delamination is quite uh, uh, low, but uh, in case of uh, inconel alloys, if you are not using uh, uh, proper current conditions, then there might be some chances of uh, uh, improper bonding between the layers and uh, these layers will be just coming out. So we can see in the cold metal transfer, the, the bead will not be uh, perfectly joining with the substrate. The bead will be coming out after, if you just apply the pressure with uh, your human hand, then the bead will be coming out. So that kind of delamination can be there uh, with the substrate and also between the between the layers the current conditions are very very low so the deformation uh, if you are talking about the deformation in the bimetallics and uh, the aluminum or the steels the uh, the severity is little bit higher there are several applications uh, i think dr madhukar and uh, professor uh, has also covered this thing I will just uh, uh, show these applications and with this, I think I will stop here and uh, if you are having any questions, I'm happy to answer. Uh, sir, I, I got some two small questions. Yes, yes. Okay. Uh, first of all, it, <clears throat> the, your presentation is really excellent. Eh? The quality of the slides is really super. Uh, the from the presentation, what I get a feeling that the functionally gradient products probably yes, this yes. is a better method, I think, because anyway you are not able to produce uniform, so you are anyway producing. Yes. I mean, by tweeting little bit of this, this is the opportunity is there, I think. Uh, other yes, things, yes. sir. Uh, uh, See yes. the, uh, yeah, please. You want to say something? something? Yes, yes, please. Uh, okay. Yes, you can ask the question. Ah, the, <clears throat> for what products this WAAM, that's why our cognitive manufacturing process will be suitable. It, although you have shown the very good landscape of products people have done all over there, but in your opinion, for which particular product this is going to be the best? I mean. Yes. So, uh, uh, answering to your first question, actually, uh, people are uh, quite working on this functionally graded materials of uh, this VAM as well. So, there is a um, uh, modification in this process where the TIG will, uh, the TIG in the TIG based DED process, uh, they will be fed in two wires simultaneously. And uh, after uh, these two wires are melted, it will be deposited. Um, as an alloy and uh, subsequently they will be depositing a single wire uh, deposition that means uh, one layer will be depositing an alloy the other layer will be depositing another thing and uh, they are working uh, rigorously on that also even in uh, friction additive manufacturing uh, in the uh, yeah, aerospace uh, components some kind of ribs are there where we are, they are using these kind of components for uh, these kind of functionally graded materials and the proper the real challenge in, in uh, the van is also to control the anisotropic properties and people are uh, seriously working on how the microstructure can be controlled in uh, from the bottom to the top of these deposits uh, this is a real uh, challenge even if we uh, read the papers that are published uh, uh, quite in this year also we can uh, still see the same challenge so that is a major challenge and uh, yeah hopefully <laughs> within uh, uh, five years or uh, so i hope there might be some solution to it and answering to the second question i am uh, uh, in i think in 2016 i have uh, first uh, seen this process in twi uh, this the building institute in cambridge so they are they are using this process to uh, manufacture the uh, turbine blades so I, 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 I happen to see this manufacturing of turbine blades where they're depositing this titanium uh, wire and uh, they are obviously there is some lot of post processing is there, but uh, this is something like uh, uh, they are comparing this with a 
single crystal material like uh, they are um, using rigorously for these turbine plates and also the titanium uh, tanks which are shown uh, i'm happy like uh, i also uh, uh, not uh, directly linked uh, like directly seen that component but the titanium uh, tank applications i have seen quite in quite uh, good number of papers one last question sir this is not really directed yes. to your presentation but i want to understand actually see the investment casting is very well yes. established to produce the casting yes. parts for the gas turbine engine that is so superior technology to single yes. crystals yes. directionally solidified equiax so much has come and it's doing very well actually today aircrafts are flying mainly because of this investment cast technology okay the now yes, this yes. this 3d printing is producing basically sorry if i am wrong actually producing defective products actually powder metallurgy is very established process 100 years old it has been producing for metal powders they learned how to do the sipping and hipping and finally they are able to produce near net shaped products equivalent matching with the forged or extruded products okay that is very well acceptable but uh, yes, the when when how much time it will take for this the, 3D printed products to reach the level of a single crystal or the directional solidified or equiax structures, which are able to provide excellent performance, highly reliable, any airworthiness, everything they are able to satisfy. Will these products ever will go to the stage of airworthiness testing for a military or a aerospace application? This is my um, because I have no idea, I have not read it. Eh? So, can you please comment on that, sir? Yes, yes, yes. yes. So, uh, 